Welcome to Theory of Pets. I'm a passionate pet owner with a drive to help others like me uncover the truth about the pet industry and what goes on behind the scenes. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Theory of Pets. If you are new to the broadcast, my name is Samantha, and I love to jump into the pet industry and answer all those questions that we all have about different things, whether it's health-related, food-related, um, related to the products that we use every day with our pets, from grooming products to toys, bedding, things like that. There are not as many regulations in the pet industry as there are in the human product industry. So a lot of questions are left unanswered for us as pet parents. And I like to spend some time each week researching and kind of diving into some of those questions that I have, some of the questions that are sent to me from you guys. So this week, actually, um, I was thinking about food. I think that's the biggest thing that we think of as pet parents uh, is the nutrition that we give our dogs from or our pets in general uh, from the food that we feed them to the treats to the snacks things like that we're always wondering about the nutrition and how that affects their overall health and I've talked on this podcast before in previous episodes which you can find on our website uh, I have looked at the health of the actual quality of the food that we feed our animals um, but This week, I've been thinking more along the lines of the health of that food and every aspect of that. And I think one of the things that we skip over, we tend to look at the ingredients in the food, the quality of those ingredients, the reputation of the company, which are all good things to look at. But one thing that I think a lot of us fail to even think about, it's not even on our radar, is the quality of the packaging of that food. What's in the packaging? Uh, If you don't know it's a lot similar to sorry it's very similar to some of the um, packaging in human food we hear a lot of things about plastics bpa Uh, we're always looking for bpa free you know plastics in the bottles and uh, the tupperware the things that we're using to store our food in but do you ever take the time to think about what your pet's food is stored in and often that's just the packaging that it comes in it's stored in that immediately when it's made at the factory that it's made in and it's shipped in that it sits on a store shelf in that um it may sit in your home in that packaging so you really want to put some effort into thinking about the quality of that packaging and I know it sounds a little bit silly maybe to some of you but think about how that packaging is made and if it's made with plastics or it's made with chemicals things like that those can leach into your dog's food so you're reading the ingredients on the packaging thinking that this is an organic product this is an all-natural product this is something that's free of um, chemical preservatives and uh, additives and then it's being packaged in a, a, a package. It's being packaged in a package. That sounds foolish. Um, but it, it's being packaged in a material that is leaching chemicals and toxins into the food. So you might be buying a high-quality diet for your dog, but it's being ruined by the chemicals that are leaching into it through the packaging. So I looked into it. There's a company called Tetra Pak, and what they do is um, they basically specialize in making healthy packaging. We're in this age, I guess, we're in this um, thing in our society where, you know, it's kind of a, a a trend brought on by the millennials, but we're looking into this clean labeling. Everybody wants this completely see-through labeling that companies are placing every single ingredient in order. There's no, um, you know, there's nothing left out. There's no trying to trick you by the labeling of what's in the products that you're buying. So we have this clean label initiative that's going on that's really bringing a lot of attention to the food and beverage industry in humans, in pets, in animals, in everything. All the foods that we're buying, we're really looking into this. So, But there's a huge gap missing, and Tetra Pak realized that, that we're not paying attention to the packaging of these products. We've gone on this huge trend of making sure that everything that we buy is super safe and healthy. 
But what about the packaging? If you're having things leach through the packaging, you're not getting the quality of food that you think you're getting. So Tetra Pak has uh, created different ways to package food that is safe and it's healthy. So this week I was able to speak with um, Blaine Johnson, who is the business development director, and uh, Lorraine, who is the communications manager over at Tetra Pak. And we discussed, uh, they actually had just come from Super Zoo when I had a conversation from uh, with them. Super Zoo is a huge expo that the pet industry holds every year uh, and they had returned from that so they had some insight there about uh, what the companies are thinking, what pet parents are looking for and uh, we discussed that and, and the things that we should be looking for as um, as consumers in the packaging of the products that we buy. So I will let you guys listen to that interview now. We, uh, as, as Lorene might have shared with you, we just recently got back from Super Zoo, and it was uh, it was it was a really uh, great experience, and uh, we saw some interesting uh, trends going on in the industry overall, and specifically to to the packaging segment as well. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I see a lot of, on my end, the trends in what we are feeding dogs, and I have so many readers that are interested in that next you know, healthiest, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, diet for dogs. And it kind of started with going more natural and organic. And now we're getting into the raw foods and things like that. And um, so there's this trend of sort of feeding your dog as well as you feed the rest of the members of your family. And it's interesting. I see it a lot with pet products, um, like BPA-free plastics and that kind of stuff coming through because people are realizing that if it's not healthy for us, it's not healthy for our dogs. Um, so I was really interested when this came across my desk to, to um, explore the packaging side of it because I, I just feel like that's a piece that's left out um, as far as pet owners are concerned. You don't really see, um, for example, a lot of times on packages you'll see um, organic or natural in big lettering and you don't really see much information about the packaging um, geared towards the advertising side of things. So I think it's interesting to kind of get that out there to pet parents so that they can understand more about the dangers of some traditional packaging and what other things there are um, to offer on the market as well. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head. Uh, I, I think that there's really two things that are going on and that they work uh, quite nicely together. Um, as you mentioned, you know, they're really not trends, but as as we as we look at maybe human food, you know, two things that are very important is, is f- uh, flavor and quality, and sp- specifically the quality of the ingredients going in there. You know, organic, all natural, hopefully, you know, no preservatives, healthy eating, and this translates, you know, not only to your your immediate family, uh, to your children, but you know, to your furry friends as well. And uh, I think that is one reason why um, we've we've been very uh, successful uh, as a company offering brand owners uh, and consumers packaging solutions uh, that really help retain the quality of the product in there. And this is is is, is segueing quite nicely over to the pet pet segment as well. I mean, really, uh, pet owners are are making their purchase decisions for their pets. Uh, based upon product, product quality and, and natural and freshness. And, and so I think you'll also see this consumer uh, that, that buys, you know, Tetra Pak cartons, um, sees the need or, or, or sees value in, in this in for their, their, their pet friends as well. And so this is really where we're coming in. And I, I think uh, the, the pet segment, has been maybe a little bit staggering. So people are looking for different opportunities, and I think it's it's good to convey uh, the quality that goes in there. So, for example, minimum amount of uh, of ingredients, uh, no preservatives, and uh, stuff that we can pronounce, and and then be be very very comfortable about what you're putting into the in, into the products as well, and maybe moving the nutritional panel to the front and keeping it very. Um, you know, clean and, and healthy, and I think you really hit it on the end, on the at the end there. Relative to packaging, is um, 
we would like to do some more uh, education to the consumers, uh, a little bit about what the, the packaging is, because uh, it is sustainable, it is BPA-free, uh, it is made from a renewable resource, and it really fits in quite uh, nicely with, with the, the message of, of, you know, natural and healthy for finished products as well as for the packaging. Yeah, and also to echo what, what Blaine said, I think we've really found success with the natural human food space, you know, because of what the carton offers that other packaging formats may not. So, you know, things like being able to, you know, package and process something without added preservatives and also having that renewable material um, package um, really resonates with natural brand owners. And, you know, I think that's true in the pet space as well as with human food. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. So we talked, we touched a little bit on it, and I think consumers are fairly well aware that um, certain things, again, plastics are a big thing right now with the BPA and things like that, that will leach from certain products, um, especially packaging, into either, um, I, again, I said we see it a lot with um, dog toys, that people are realizing that those products, are, those toxins and chemicals are leaching into your dog's system through when he's chewing on toys and things like that and the same can be said about food packaging um so there are some dangers with traditional packaging that things are are leaching into the food um can you speak on that a little bit sure yeah Yeah, i think uh go ahead larry i'm sorry yeah i was gonna say i think i can i can touch on it a little blame can probably speak more specifically but i mean generally speaking from like a chemical perspective you know all of our packages are you know fda compliant and we actually take that very seriously as far as you know protecting the food, so ensuring that nothing does get into the product itself. Um, BPA being a great example, um, our cartons don't have BPA in them, and I know that that's certainly a hot-button um, issue, and, you know, not just with, you know, human food and water bottles and things like that, but certainly with pet food, and I think we saw that a lot this week, too, at Super Zoo. So what are some of those dangers of the traditional packaging that um, that you're trying to move away from? What are some of those dangers that pet parents should be aware of? Yeah, I, I think it's twofold. Obviously, the the BPA segment uh, is huge. Uh, is unfortunately with a lot of the uh, the tins or the cans that you're seeing in the marketplace, not only for the pet segment but also for uh, human consumption, um, it is is the the presence of BPA in it. And um, obviously, there's a lot of factors that imp- impact the uh, the BPA load, uh, the pH or the acidity of the product. Uh, how long the product might have been cooked or pasteurized in the can. Uh, we, we try to to offer um, a very low heat thermal profile to our products. Obviously, it's very product dependent, but basically, we want we don't want to overcook them because uh, it's very important not to have to ha- add additional vitamins or minerals or preservatives to uh, the product. And so if you if you overcook it, uh, it destroys a lot of the natural nutrients that, that's in the, the, the fresh food, uh, if it's human or dog. And then what are some of the things, so um, can you tell me a little bit about Tetra Pak and what are you guys offering that I guess that other traditional um, packaging doesn't offer? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and, and Lorraine, feel free to chime in. I, I think one of the things that we, our biggest, uh, I guess, key to success, if you will, is um, is, is the recyclability. And, and basically, if you look at our packaging, it's, it's made from, 70% of it's from uh, from wood, and, and which is a managed forest. So unlike uh, maybe a stand-up couch, which is made from polyethylene or a can, or a PET bottle, uh, these are all made from fossil fuels. Now, granted, we do use a, a little bit of a PET uh, as a lining inside of our packaging, but I, I think we also have a very green initiative um, as we move forward to to look at alternative motives. So maybe it's a, a cap that's made from sugar cane, and, and it, it's not on the immediate horizon, but something we're looking heavily into it is, is using that, that same type of material as a lining. Uh, in, in our packaging as well, so I think that's that that is one nice thing. And, you know, for example, it's really there's a lot of segments that go into it. It's obviously sourcing the original packaging, which is the paper, but uh, the, and, and the recycling segment's important. But also too is the greenhouse gases during the production, the transportation 
uh, of unfinished and finished goods. So if I were to make uh, a truckload of future recar packages, for example, uh, because they lay flat, uh, you're looking at about nine times as many trucks needed just to bring in uh, the the actual packaging of, of one of our type of formats versus uh, a, a tin can, for example. So, so that just helps uh, Mother Earth on that segment. Yeah, and I think if you're looking, um, you know, really just very specifically at consumer benefits, because there are, there are certainly a lot of um, supply chain benefits, as Blaine had mentioned, but, you know, for us, when we think about kind of the benefits of cartons and pet food, it's really three categories. One is just the, the food safety and the quality of the food inside. So because depending on the type of carton you use and the type of processing you use, you know, it really eliminates the need for preservatives, but also has shorter cooking time. So you get a little bit, you know, fresher tasting um, product that, you know, where the nutrients are retained a little bit better. Um, another huge advantage is really in the functionality of the, of the package. So you don't need any tools to open a carton, for example. So think about, you know, have a kid having to open even the pull-top cans where there could be sharp edges, you know, with the Tetra Pak cartons that either has a cap that you can twist off or is a perforation. So a little bit more um, functional, easy to use. Um, and also the shape, you know, of the carton, it's very pantry friendly, if you will. So you can fit a lot more, you know, in your pantry. It stacks nicely. It's not as heavy. So if you, you know, drop a carton on your foot, for example, it's less likely to hurt than, you know, something like a can or a glass jar or something like that. Sure. And I say that from experience. <laughs> um, and, and then the third, which Wayne touched on, is really, you know, looking at the sustainability of the package compared to other formats and the fact that it is made from, on average, 70% renewable materials. Um, that's, that's a huge benefit. And um, that you see, you know, consumers are starting to understand the concept of renewability a lot more. Um, but then even looking at recyclability and really the whole life cycle of the package, um, what cartons have to offer uh, is really strong. So something that consumers can really easily see. And I think from a branding perspective, you know, for pet food brands, especially natural pet food brands, uh, it's a really nice way to kind of get that brand story out there in a very tangible way with the package. Certainly. Are there any um, brands right now? Do you have any dog food brands, that, some of the bigger name brands that are using Tetra Pak containers? Uh, there are a few. There is. Um, Whiskas has a cat milk. Oh. Um, that's probably the biggest brand, if you will, um, that's in carton. There's also a product called Cat Sip, which is, is fairly big, enough. also a cat milk. And then we have a dog food product, um, Karoo. Yeah, actually, it's funny. Big... I did an interview um, with Karoo uh, a couple of weeks ago. Oh, great. Yeah, they're, they're doing some really great stuff. Um, they're, you know, they're all human-grade products. They just launched a bone broth at Super Zoo. That, yeah. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Wonderful. I didn't realize they used your containers. That's great. So yeah. for people that um, maybe they they have a brand that they stick with, their dog's fussy or needs a certain diet or something like that, so they, they can't find um, a brand that uses a Tetra Pak carton, let's say, um, but what are those, some of the things maybe that they should try and stay away from or some of the things that they should be looking for in the packaging of the products that they're buying for their pets? Yeah, I think I think that's a tough one because I think it depends a little bit on, you know, what, what specifically they're looking for. Um, I will say in general it's probably tough to just pick up a package and know exactly um, what it could or couldn't be doing uh, to the food inside because it's not typically – you know, print it on the package, um, especially if it's bad news. A brand certainly isn't going to say, hey, by the way. <laughs> you know, yeah. so I would say, you know, in doing your research, just becoming aware of, of kind of the different types of packages that are out there and, you know, some of the benefits and drawbacks of all of them. Um, I think also from a sustainability perspective, you know, understanding truly, you know, what what is sustainable, um, you know, looking at you know, something, as an example, like glass jars, um, people tend to look at the glass jar and think, wow, that's really you know, natural and it's good for the product and it's, you know, a sustainable packaging option. Um, but it actually requires significant fossil fuels um, to make a package like that compared to something like a carton. So I think it's really, you know, if it's important to you as a consumer, it, unfortunately you have to do a little bit of research, um, looking at third parties in a lot of cases as well, because, again, it's not always readily apparent on the package itself. Are there standards that, um, not just pet products, but that any type of product for packaging, are there standards for that or just pretty much for the food that's contained inside? I mean, generally speaking, all packages have to be FDA approved. So, yeah. you know, at bare minimum, you should be getting, a, a, I mean, a solid level of safety. Um, I think it's when you get into things like BPA and, and chemicals like that, 
you know, what's, what's your tolerance? What are you willing to yeah. accept and what are you not as a consumer? Unfortunately, I think we're, as a consumer market, we're starting to realize that FDA approved doesn't always mean safe or healthy um, for our families, which is, is sad but true. Um, on the yeah. packaging, does it have to be marked FDA approved? Do you know? No, I don't believe so. Glenn. I don't know if you know. No, if it, there's it, a... it doesn't. But uh, um, that even if it's an imported uh, packaging material or domestic, uh, it does have to go through three things uh, relative to the FDA. One is uh, the designs have to be submitted uh, to the FDA, and a making sure we're not nothing as an ingredient going in there that could be hazardous. Uh, B, making sure that uh, kind of a policing type of action in terms of making claims that may not be true, like a heart healthy or something like that, uh, and more of a registration. And I think um, even though they've slipped in most eight, eight times, but um, everything that, that goes into our packaging, if, if it's on the liquid or, or the solid side, um, as you make it, you have to submit to the FDA the filing. So basically, if I'm making a, a, a product for, for dogs and it's in Petri Cart packaging, this goes for other formats as well. I, I can't speak for every, everything, but you have to submit to them where the ingredients came from, uh, the process times, and just and then file these. And so it's saying, so essentially this carton was cooked at this time for this amount of time, and it went through these quality control measures just to help try to ensure uh, that that safe product is going out into the marketplace. Does it work all the time? No, but does it work a majority of the time for, for pet as well as uh, human-grade products? Absolutely. But as far as the packaging goes, consumers can't really get a lot of information about the packaging from what's written on the packaging, I guess. Yeah, I think it's, it's from a regulatory standpoint, no. But I think, you know, some, again, I think they're more likely to call out the, the positive attributes. So we see a lot of our customers really pointing out, yeah, you know, like pointing the renewability the, factors. Sure. Yeah. So it, but uh, yeah, there's, I know there's, um, you know, some states are looking at some regulations where there needs to be some kind of call out, um, you know, to the consumer about certain elements that are within the package, but there's nothing you know, widespread at this point. Right, right. No, it makes sense. Of course, they're not going to want to say that it's made in a package that has BPA or anything like that. But um, I'm sure, like you said, your customers are excited to promote the fact that they're using a sustainable, um, better quality packaging. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think we covered it well. You know, I, I think one aspect that we talk a lot about um, the consumers and, and quality, I, I guess my two top takeaways, one is uh, you were asking about healthy products, and, and I think this translates right over to, to something that you would consume yourself. If you look at the back, you know, the nutritional panel, and it's, it's got a whole bunch of really long, word, long words you can't pronounce and means nothing to you, you probably don't want to eat it nor feed it to your to your pets, right? And so that is, I think, one trend that we do see with, with uh, the TetraPak products is, uh, is, is very clean labels, very short and simple. Uh, I, I think that's one, and and then just an interesting uh, factoid, Amanda, is is there's also some benefits that uh, go to the retailer. So, for example, because of the rectangular type of, of size uh, versus maybe a can or a, a stand-up pouch that needs a lot of secondary packaging to support it upright. Uh, retailers like it because we are seeing this kind of migration to smaller regional stores and, and basically this allows them to put up you know about 30 percent more product on their shelves um, because of the shape of the package and also it has a nice billboard effect as well that you can't always get with some other type of format oh that's true yeah yeah i think one of the things i was <laughs> thinking kind of as we were talking was um obviously if a company is putting ingredients that you can't read artificial things and that kind of stuff in there product they're probably not as concerned about the packaging that their products going into so i would assume that um, a lot of the companies using higher quality packaging are also going to be those higher quality products inside mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. i think that's I yeah, fair to say
need to thank Blaine and Lorraine for speaking with me and talking to us about Tetra Pak and all the important qualities that we should be looking for in the packaging of the food and treats that we're buying for our dog. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. You can jump right on our website, which is theoryofpets.com. Uh, there's a section on there where you guys can either type up your questions or your comments, concerns, anything like that, or you can also record your questions and your comments and I might use those on future podcasts so if you're interested in that make sure you check out that section um if you guys could also just jump on iTunes really quickly and give my podcast a review I would really appreciate that uh, it helps me get it out there and uh when I approach experts in the pet industry about coming on the podcast if they can see a lot of good reviews um, that really spurs them to want to do the podcast to reach more uh, listeners. So if you guys could just take a second jump on iTunes, that would be great. Again, theoryofpets.com. Uh, any comments or questions, I'd be happy to uh, address those for you. And certainly if I can't answer the question myself, I can reach out to Blaine or Lorraine or any other contact that I might have uh, to try and answer those for you. If you have any ideas for upcoming podcasts, any burning questions that you've been trying to figure out and you think that I might be able to help you out, please don't hesitate. I will see you guys or actually I won't be seeing you, but you guys will be listening to me next time. I uh, have an interview with a dog yoga instructor and they call it Doga and uh, um, or Daga, I guess. And uh, she's really wonderful. She gave me a lot of great information. So if you've been looking for a new way to exercise with your pet, stay tuned because that is coming on next week's episode. Thanks for listening, guys.